Um, welcome everyone. Um, so we've got, we got about 33 people that have been able to join so far. We're going to have more, I assume, as we keep going along. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Randy Crum. I'm the organizer of the DFW Data Viz Meetup. Um, and we're going to go through a little bit of introduction um, and some announcement slides uh, before we introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, so as you see here on the on the screen, uh, two things. We've got two windows in tonight's uh, Zoom webinar. One is for any questions uh, for Q&A after Steve's talk tonight. Um, go ahead anytime during the talk, even now, if you want to um, type in your questions in the Q&A panel. You should have a Q&A button uh, in the control bar at the bottom of your window. Um, and you can see hopefully if I set things up right, um, you can see other people's questions as well and you'll be able to upvote questions um, as you see them pop up throughout the, uh, the presentation. And then as we've been using the chat, uh, just to say hi and welcome and let us know where you're connecting in from, um, feel free to use the chat anytime um, for you know, comments or uh, if you have something you need to wanna share um, that's related to the talk or whatever or links um, that type of thing, because this is, you know, this is our community. This is our place to share. Um, so, like I said, um, I run the DFW Data Viz Meetup Group. Um, so, if you are not currently a member, um, you can get there on Meetup, or I set up the URL dfwdataviz.com. They'll get you straight to the Meetup uh, website, um, and you can join us there. Um, we're now up over four thousand members, which is fantastic, um, and we are looking forward to being. Uh, more active in 2021 as much as we can be, but it's gonna be mostly virtual um, as we move forward. Uh, like I said, my name's Randy Crum. So if you don't know me, um, I am a data viz designer. Um, my company, I run a company called InfoNute and we do data viz design for companies all over the world. Um, I run a website called Cool Infographics. I also wrote the book called Cool Infographics. Um, and I teach a course, an online certificate course, which I'll talk about in just a second um, at SMU on uh, data viz and communication. And you can find me on Twitter anytime um, at RT Crumb. Um, so you can do that. So this is the course that I teach. Um, I'll just mention it really briefly because our next session is coming up. It's going to start on March 4th. Um, Steve and I teach a course on data viz and communication. And it's uh, part data viz, data viz best practices, uh, how to design data slides for a presentation, infographics, dashboards, data viz uh, pitfalls and you know the mistakes people make in data visualization, um, as well as Steve teaches a whole bunch of things about storytelling, how to prepare for a presentation, how to read your audience, body language during presentations. Um, so it's all about um, combining the ideas of visualizing your data um, and um, being able to stand up and give a presentation, whether that's on Zoom or live in person, um, to your executives, to customers, to your investors, to whoever, um, so that you're communicating with your data. Um, I can share, um, let's see if I can do that also, um, that if you're interested in that, I'm happy to answer questions um, if you wanna talk offline about that. Um, but if anybody's interested in registering for that, um, they've given me this code, Randy10, that will not only get you 10% off of my certificate course at SMU, um, but also any of those other certificate courses. If you go to smu.edu slash pro, that 10% discount will apply to any of their certificate courses. And so it's completely online. You can take the course from anywhere in the world. Um, it was designed that way before COVID hit us, um, which is really nice. And so it's a, a certificate course that goes 18 weeks. Um, a couple things uh, just about this. This is a webinar format that I'm experimenting with. This will be our first time using the webinar format with Zoom. Um, so let me know. I'd love to hear some feedback, um, but we don't always do this. Um, this is really meant for guest speaker events, um, but when we do, whether it's a planning meeting or a sharing or a how-to event where we want a lot of interaction, a lot of discussion, we would use the meeting and then everybody can be on mic and, and speak all the time. But for guest speakers like this, uh, the webinar format works a lot better. Um, and so we're going to be going back and forth um, in different types of events throughout the year. Um, and I do also want to thank Capital Factory. Um, Capital Factory normally gives us a lot of space um, to hold our events in person when that's available. And I hope someday we'll be able to go back and do that again. Um, but they also help us promote um, events throughout all of their memberships as well. 
Um, as a community, this is our community for you. Like I said, we're up over 4,000 members now in the DFW area. And normally, if we have a live in-person event, um, and sometimes we'll, we'll try to hold some meeting events where we, people can stand up and speak. So if you are looking for a job or your company is actually has an opening and you're, you're trying to hire people to fill uh, roles at your company, um, our community is their place to share that. So um, in this case, that's tough to do in the webinar format. Um, so what I would like to do um, is just invite you that this is your community and that on the meetup page uh, for the DFW Data Viz group, there is a discussion board. Um, and down at the bottom of that page, any member can post uh, a comment or a link down in that discussion area. And so if you are looking for a role, um, go down there and post what you're looking for, maybe a link to your LinkedIn profile or something like that. Um, if your company has an open position, um, post that there and a link to uh, the careers page or the jobs page on your company site, you know, that type of thing. So use that discussion area for the community um, to help you um, find stuff uh, here in the area, whether you're looking or looking to hire. Um, and on top of that, um, I also run a, a Slack community for the DFW area, the, the data community is what I call it, the data community Slack. Um, it's free to join um, and it has discussion boards. If you're not familiar with Slack, it's a discussion workspace, um, but it has a whole bunch of channels. And so there is a jobs channel that can do the same thing. You can post that you're looking for work or that you have an open position, but there's an events channel. There's an education channel. There's a data viz channel. Um, there's just a general channel. Uh, but there's also some uh, specific channels like a Tableau channel or a Microsoft channel or an R uh, channel. And so it's really a, a discussion space uh, for the DFW data community and everybody's free to join. Um, but the idea of the way Slack works is that you have to either have an invitation or have the link to be able to join the group. And so if you use this link, I've created this new shortened link um, because the last link from last year expired. So this is a new link if you haven't done it before, dfwdataviz.com slash Slack will let you uh, join that group. Okay, next. Uh, Tim, let me introduce Tim. Um, our co-sponsor, co-host tonight is the North Texas Tableau User Group. And so Tim, I'll shut off my video. You just let me know when you want me to advance a slide. Uh, all right, yeah, thanks Randy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, like Randy mentioned, we're kind of co-hosting this uh, event tonight. Um, Steve was on both of our radars as a guest speaker, and we thought it made sense to kind of collaborate on this one. Uh, so for those of you uh, not familiar with our group, or maybe you're here for the first time, uh, the North Texas tug uh, was revived by uh, Joey Ramos about three and a half years ago, um, and we really, really started to hit our stride late in uh, 2019, early 2020. <clears throat> um, I joined the team about two years ago, and, and Joey and I quickly realized, you know, Putting a group together like this is a lot of work. Uh, we were responsible for most of the content at the time. So uh, we've added uh, Brady and Stephen most recently to the team. Um, so right at the bottom, we get an idea of what our, our leadership team looks like. And we're excited for, uh, for what 2021 holds. Um, for those of you who are interested, we meet in Plano when we're in person. But of, of course, since March of 2020, we've been doing uh, virtual meetups. And uh, we do keep it Tableau focused. Um, of course, it's a type of user group, but uh, we try to discuss kind of general data topics uh, when it makes sense. Um, if you're interested in joining our groups, of course, we're on LinkedIn, uh, the Rio uh, North Texas Tableau user group, and um, on Twitter as well. We kind of, uh, we try to share some of our favorite content from around the data viz world there, um, feature some speakers, and of course, share all of our events. Uh, Brandy, if you wouldn't mind hopping to the next slide for me. Uh, what I'm here to talk about tonight, real briefly, is uh, kind of our schedule uh, going forward for those of you that uh, use Tableau or attend our groups. Um, so in the past, uh, we haven't been uh, as proactive as we can be, uh, kind of about planning our events and letting folks know ahead of time what to expect. And that's something we wanted to change here in 2021. So as you can see by the schedule, uh, we have our first few events planned out. And uh, what we're doing differently this year uh, than in past years is kind of focusing on a, a skill area or competency, competency area um, for a couple months at a time. In February and March, we'll have a focus on uh, data literacy. Uh, as you can see, data engineering will follow that. Um, that would be, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about Tableau Prep, maybe some alterics, how those tools compare, uh, some best practices when building data sources. 
Uh, during the summer months, June and July, we're going to get into the functional applications of Tableau. Uh, so to us, that means uh, getting into kind of the nitty gritty with calculations, um, things like that, table calculations, uh, product updates, that sort of thing. Wrapping up the year, we're going to do uh, some form and uh, design sessions. And finally, some soft skills and uh, how to ultimately deliver your dashboards to stakeholders. So we have some cool stuff planned. Um, but for tonight, we're here to uh, want to, of course, share our schedule with you, but also announce our February guest. Um, so if you would mind hop in one more slide for me, Randy. Our February guest on the 23rd will be Ben Jones. So um, if you're uh, involved in kind of in the, the data literacy world, so to speak, uh, you'll know Ben is rather large name, is one of the thought leaders in the data literacy space. And uh, he's uh, published five books to this point, all uh, around that data, data literacy topic. Uh, ben is gonna join us, like I said, in February, uh, 223. He's gonna be talking about some of his, um, some of the content he has in his most recent book there, uh, Learning to See Data. So. Uh, if you're available, that's a great session to join. Uh, whether you use Tableau or not, that is a, a tool agnostic session. So we, uh, we hope to see you there for that. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Randy. All right. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Um, and we're going to post and promote Ben's talk as well for February. So you'll see that in the Data Viz Meetup group as well. Um, and Without further ado, then, let's introduce Steve. Um, so let me welcome Steve Wexler. And if you're not familiar with Steve Wexler, let me spend the next 20 minutes giving you his internet. No, I'm kidding. Um, so Steve uh, has his own company called Data Revelations um, and is known um, in the mainly in the Tableau community, but also in the, the broader data viz community um, and is very well respected. He was one of the co-authors, as you can see here on the screen of the big book of dashboards um, and has a new book coming out later this year called The Big Picture. Um, Steve, you were a, a, a Tableau Zen master, I think five times. You've been an Iron Viz champion and you're one of the advisors for the data viz society. Is that correct? That is correct. I got it. And then of course, feel free to add whatever else you'd like to, but um, I'm gonna stop sharing and let you take over the screen. So welcome, Steve. We really, really well, appreciate you. you coming tonight. So delighted to be here. Um, you, you know, you mentioned that you were uh, a uh, partner in crime for uh, the class that you give talks about reading people's body language when giving a presentation. And oh, how I miss that right now. I'm oh, looking over here <laughs> at the participants window and I'm going, I, I think they're smiling and having a good time. Um, and it's, why, it's why you like to have, you know, when you're doing the, the meetings, et cetera, hey, keep your camera on so I can- Keep you your know, camera on, I like to see people. I, used to, I miss seeing people. Yeah, can, can know when you're nodding off, et cetera. By the way, I believe this is officially my thousandth Zoom meeting. I'm very excited to share oh. it with all of you. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> getting a little little certificate and plaque from, um, from uh, Conrad Zoom there. So uh, let me share my screen. Let's get Get into the uh, discussion. Yep. Just a last and minute reminder for Q and A. So post any questions throughout the talk in that Q and A window. Use that Q and A button, and then we'll we'll hit a bunch of those questions at the end of Steve's talk, and then I will bow out, Steve, and leave it to you. Thank you so much, uh, and thanks for making the time today. And uh, let's have a good time with this. So, how to get your organization to value data visualization? and you. Um, I show this in virtually every presentation, um, every workshop that I give, and that is and you Steve, are in... Yes? I'm not seeing your screen yet. Well, let's try this again with feeling. I'm, I'm seeing it on my end, Randy. Okay. I must have the wrong window open. Okay. So let's try that again. I'm I sorry. Hope. I'm in, I'm just totally. I just can't. I'm just do gonna this throw anymore. you out. Start over. <laughs> yep. I should be working up. In any case, I will show this at virtually any time I give a presentation, any time I give a workshop. You are encouraged to disagree with me. Good things happen when we debate and discuss 
data visualization. If there's something I'm saying, hey, that doesn't resonate with me, that's not my experience, that's not the case here. You can bring it up in chat, you can bring it up in the Q&A. Um, and as I'm gonna discuss, um, when these things happen, you debate and discuss intelligently and respectfully with each other, you may end up making something a lot better than what you would have done on your own. Well, let's get to the crux of this, which is you're all either currently expert or novice or, or budding data visualization practitioners, um, and some of you with ridiculous experience, but if your organization doesn't value data visualization itself, you know, they're probably not going to value you. And, and so you bring a ridiculous amount to the organization. They just may not know it yet. And so you need to show them how potent data visualization can be to help people um, see and understand their data, glean insights that they wouldn't have gleaned before. And well, how did this thing all come about? You know, the, 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 both the first book, The Big Book of Dashboards, and the upcoming one, The Big Picture, it came about in response to just interacting with people and seeing that there was a need for it. And I want to sort of set up what I feel like anytime I go into giving a workshop, um, especially the opening of the workshop, which is the fundamentals of data visualization, kind of a crass course in stuff that people should know. Remember, the, the workshops I'm giving right now, these are for people who are practitioners in the field, that people are going to be creating world-class business dashboards. And this is kind of me at the beginning of every workshop, which is, doesn't everybody already know this stuff? You know, that, that, that do I have anything to bring to the table? Um, and um, so that first question, doesn't everybody already know this? It becomes abundantly clear within 10, 15 minutes they don't. And, in, and remember, these are the practitioners. So I'm realizing, okay, there's a bunch of stuff that people just don't know, don't understand, that's pretty fundamental, not just to the practitioner, but the person, the consumer of these things. But the other thing that comes about is a frustration by the attendees. They get data visualization, but their boss, their stakeholders, their organization as a whole, doesn't value it or doesn't quite see just how transformative it could be. And this gets to a discussion, they'll say, yeah, my, everybody in my organization, they just want to use spreadsheets. They think spreadsheets are great and spreadsheets are fine. And, and, and this leads to a discussion of why just the numbers isn't good enough. And we'll have a discussion about, you know, these people who are just cling to their spreadsheets. And I'll show you kind of an amalgam of every client uh, I've had over the last 15 years who doesn't yet buy into what this can, can give them. You know, you can have my spreadsheet when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. Well, how do you start to convince someone that, hey, that's great that you're great at spreadsheets. No one's taking away your spreadsheet. It's just maybe harder to figure out stuff that's going on than you may think. You know, for example, have a look at this. 12 months of sales for three categories. Which category is the top seller? Which category is the lowest? And they'd say, oh, come on, that's easy. You know, I don't have to scan through all the numbers. Just put a total at the end and I can see it immediately. Boom. I can see corporate is bigger than consumer is bigger than education. Fair point. Got it. All right. Now ask this question. When was that not the case? Yeah, I can see corporate is flying high, but when did it dip? And did it dip the second place or third place? And did anything else either have a big dip or a big increase? Well, that's much harder to tell from this. But if you show the people this in a line chart, and, and by the way, you know, people have hit me to notice there's no color legend. I'm uh, directly labeling the stuff here. Nice, nice habit to do. Um, you know, you can see this stuff instantly. Hey, corporate is on top, except in March. What happened there? Yikes. And I can see the consumer was second, but what happened in July? And that's very hard to tell from the other item. Simple question and say, look how easy it is to answer this thing with a line chart than it is with the spreadsheet. Still though, they may go, look, I like my numbers. How can you start to nurse them 
into data visualization. I'll show you um, one of my favorite techniques. It's using a highlight table. That's the term the Tableau calls it. If you're an Excelian, you may know this as uh, conditional formatting. And I call whatever you call it, I call it the gateway drug to data visualization. So have a look at this um, simple cross tab slash spreadsheet. It consists of four regions along the top. Get that set up over here, four regions along the top, 17 different product subcategories. Okay, as you look at this, sorry about that. Um, in which combination of product subcategory and region are things most profitable and where are they least profitable? Now realize you've got 17 different products at product subcategories, you've got four different regions. This means you are going to have to look at scan 68 different cells. And you're going to have to look at it sequentially. And the fastest person I've seen do this can do this in about 10, 12 seconds. It usually takes people about 20 seconds and about a third get it wrong. Well, the correct answer is tables in the east is lowest and office machines in the south is highest. Well, if I make one slick formatting change to this. I can make it that people at the back of the room who can't even read the numbers can know exactly where things are doing well. And color code the cells. This is called a highlight table. It's a text table, but the cells are color coded. And immediately you can see the tables in the east is the worst. You can see that office machines in the south is the best. You can also see tables in general are doing terribly. And you can see that binders and accessories are doing really well. And um, as are a bunch of other categories, stuff just pops out and you haven't taken away the beloved numbers. Well, let's say now they, you've, you've got them into these highlight tables. Let's take them one step further. I'm gonna show you um, a highlight table showing tech support calls by hour of day and day of week. And if time permits, I'll tell you what was the data set for this because it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, but you can probably see there's you know, some serious pockets of activity, like right here, a lot of activity, very little activity here, fair amount of activity here, a eh, little activity in the morning, some in the evening, but it's really around noon time that there's a lot, great. Now, suppose someone says, what day of the week do we get the most tech support calls? What day of the week do we get the fewest? Same with hour of the day. When's the most, when's the fewest? That's hard to answer in this. But if we build a marginal histogram around this thing, you can answer those questions instantly. Now, let's play you know, a devil's advocate here and go, well, wait a second. Why don't you just put totals on this thing? You can but you're now back to scanning through a whole bunch of numbers and going, which one's the biggest? Which one's the smallest? Is that one bigger? No, 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 I found a bigger one. Well, what happens if you color code these things? Well, the problem is you have a massive difference in scale for the total than you do for the innards of the cell. So it can be kind of hard to color code this stuff. Also, let me show you the drawbacks. As great as color coding is, you're not going to make exact comparisons with them. Let me just um, highlight one little part of this, which is I just want to look at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. And I can see that 11 a.m., there are twice as many calls at 10 a.m. And how do I know it's twice as many? Because there are two numbers in there and I can do math in my head. Watch what happens if I take the number out, which is a great way to test the potency of your data visualization. If you take out the numbers, can people still get it? I can't tell that's twice as big. Now watch what happens if we look at the bar chart. Take away the numbers. Oh, that's really easy to see. That's about twice as big. And so let me show you this very cool quote. We can say that one shade is darker than another. That is obvious. But to say that it is two or three times as dark is not visible. It is not readable. And I will give um, 15 bonus points to anyone who knows who said this, who uh, uh, made that quote. You know, I'm not going to look for people to put it into chat, but it was Charles Menard in 1861. You know, the guy who did that thing, 
and that people show is the greatest chart ever made, and then you try to make that in your own organization and people don't adopt data visualization, um, don't bring this into your organization unless you know it will resonate with your audience. All right, so that's kind of the first step is show some typical questions, some typical problems, uh, some, and, and then guide people through, hey, you know, instead of just a table full of numbers, let's color code them. Hey, maybe if we put these bar charts around there, and you may start to get people nodding their head and going, this is useful. Here's the other thing that has been ridiculously successful for me, how to make dashboards irresistible and in fact change people's behavior. Make your stakeholder the focus of the dashboard. This has taken a huge amount of design pressure off of me. I do not have great uh, design chops. No one is hiring me to make an infographic. You know, um, uh, I go to Randy for help with that type of stuff um, and for you know design acumen. But I'm still succeeding with my dashboards because I kind of take a cue from this guy. This is Ed Koch. He was the mayor of New York City from 1977 till 1989. He had a famous catchphrase, how am I doing? Because people want to know stuff about themselves. And let me show you how I'm going to take something which may be to most people a boring visualization and make it friggin' fascinating to you. This is a histogram showing a breakdown of population in the United States as of census figures that I have as of 2019. What do we have here? Along the bottom is the age, yeah, we'll use the fancy thing. I have the age of people over here, and I have how many people fall into that age. So newborns, they're about 3.7, 3.8 million. People who are 30, woo, they're about 4.7 million. And that's how you read this thing. Um, a lot of people look at this, whoa, what is this giant fall off? So people are like dying at 73 or 74. What's up with that? It's not that they're dying. It's that's the cusp of the baby boomer generation. More people were born in 1946. In any case, I find this fascinating. My friends and family who are not into data visualization, they don't think this is so interesting. But I got inspired by a colleague. Um, uh, 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 Chad uh, Skelton and uh, decided, you know what, let me make my audience, the stakeholder, the centerpiece of this. So that's that same histogram that we had over here. It was boring. But now it's here's where you are within this. Here's the people who are older. Here are the people that young are younger. And I'm going to uh, do this thing live or try to. Uh, hold on one second. Let me find what I'm looking for here. And that's not the one I want. Here we go. Let me refresh this. So I'm going to ask for a volunteer here to, in chat, um, um, if you would be kind enough to give me your age and gender, and I will tell you how much older or younger you are than other people in the United States. Okay, wow, a lot of people coming in. And hold on, there's someone who, um, who is 39 and male. And uh, all right, you know, let's do that. Let's just focus in on males. And I'm gonna select 39. And I gotta tell you, it's a little depressing, but you are older than 52% of other Americans. These are the people who are younger than you. These are the people who are older than you. Uh, let me go to the woman who is 24 and female, who I will have no sympathy for whatsoever. Um, 24, female, and you are younger than 69.7% of female Americans, you know, here's the people that are younger, here's all the people that are older and that little slice there, that's you. Um, I will take one for the team right now, um, male, and I am 62. I have gotten to, used to how painful this is, it no longer hurts quite as much. 
and I am older than 81.5% of male Americans. The greatest solace I take in all of this is I have an older brother. He has lorded that he's five years older than I am. He has lorded that over me for a very long time, and now I have some sweet revenge. Um, so you, kind of my point around this, though, is you give this someone, they're going to put their age in. They're going to use it. They're going to learn something. You've made them the focus of this thing. And they're going to do themselves. They're going to do their partner, their kid, their parent, et cetera. Anytime you can do that, you're probably going to garner more engagement. All right, let me go back to uh, what we're looking at here. Let me just show one more example, which is, let's say you are a um, uh, director and you have you know, 15 different reports, they all manage different stores, and you've created this personalized dashboard, and it will show each store manager how she or he or she is doing in all these different categories with respect to others. You may have to teach them how to read a few things you know, for a minute. So you know, over here, this, this gray shaded part, that's just showing lower quartile, median, and upper quartile. So if we look at this person's performance, it's like, wow, you know, they're, they're in the lowest quartile, you know, they've got an overall score of 6.1. They're really terrible in cleanliness. They're okay and treated me as a valued customer. They're terrible in staff knowledge, and they're pretty good at fast checkout lines. All right, well, that's great. They now have a sense of where they are and where they need to improve. So now realize no one knows who the other dots are. They only know about themselves. You know, they can't hover over another dot and go, wow, look how lame this person is. And if you're thinking, well, gosh, that's got to, going to probably feel pretty bad to be kind of the bottom of the pack. Well, you're trying to improve behavior. So, you know, you meet with this person. Maybe you ask for some coaching from some of the people who have really high scores, but imagine how much better this person is going to feel next, uh, next month when they see how their scores have moved. You know, they went from 14 out of 15 overall to 11 out of 15 overall. By the way, this chart is called a comment chart. But you've, you've made your stakeholder the centerpiece of this thing, they're going to use it. They're going to want to look at it. And um, I'm seeing a lot, of, um, a lot of websites and newspapers are doing this. This was a fascinating piece from the New York Times opinion page, which is everyone wants to know, when can I get my vaccine? And they put together this interactive thing where you can put your age and you know where you live and do you have COVID-related health risk and things like that. And then it would show you roughly where you are in line to get the vaccine, okay? Fortun unfortunately, um, or fortunately, because it means I'm, I'm, I'm not terribly old and I'm not uh, at a health risk, I'm going to have to wait a while. So you get the idea behind it. All right. So those were two different things that may help to get people excited about what it is you bring to the table. But the next piece is discussion of how to win a data viz argument. You know, as they start to adopt this stuff and start doing it, I mean, come on, how many people have asked you to do some pretty lame stuff? And we're going to discuss some of the lame things you'll probably be, be asked to do. So I, I'm going to show you, you know, three, four different examples. Hey, bar charts are boring. Use pack bubbles instead. This dashboard isn't colorful enough. Please use more colors. Everybody knows what red and green mean. Use red and green. Pie charts are great. Donut charts are even better. And this is a symbol that we use in the big book of dashboards. Um, I'm no longer calling it a screaming cat. I called it a scaredy cat. It means this is probably not something that you should be doing. Well, my question to you are, are you prepared to address these things as they come up? And, and you may be great and badass and have degrees in this stuff. Realize you don't want to come in like this delightful rodent. I love this book, reading it to my kids. It was called Hawaii for Wadney Wat. And there was a character called Camilla Capybara. And she would come in as, I'm bigger than any of you, I'm meaner than any of you, and I'm smarter than any of you. So there. That's not going to go over well in your organization. The other thing is, are you, in fact, 
prepared to make good cases for these different things, you know, versus just, oh, I don't know, Stephen Few told me that, you know, pie charts are bad, so pie charts are bad. So we're going to start with this first one. Bar charts are boring, use pack bubbles instead, which leads me to why the F do we see so many friggin' bar charts? And not so easy for me to gauge in this group, but, um, uh, you know, I will ask who thinks bar charts are boring or who has stakeholders who think that bar charts are boring, right? And I'm not going to take a poll right now. I know some people think they're boring. Um, thank you, David. Too many bar charts. I love bar charts. All right. It's not the bar chart. It's your data that's boring. And in my head, I hear Lewis Black spitting that out. It's not the bar chart. It's your data that's boring. So, Here's a problem that people will kind of uh, run into. So here is a bunch of numbers. How would I visualize this? Well, if you let your tool do what it wants to do, in my case, my tool of choice is Tableau, but this is Excel, it's Click, it's, it's Power BI. It's gonna wanna make a bar chart that looks like this. And you decide, oh, well, that's not interesting or arresting enough, and you start futzing around, particularly with the show me button, and you come across this thing. And you go, wow, that looks so cool. I don't want to make something that looks like that. Not realizing, well, that is visually arresting. And it may attract somebody. It's not going to answer many questions. Quickly, what's third from the bottom? What's second from the top? How much larger is copiers than machines? These are things that you can answer in seconds with the bars, but they're really hard with this other thing. And I just want to show you, give you a sense of how innately good humans are without any training at judging the length of bars and how crappy humans are at judging the size of circles. So um, what I would like you to do is go to bigpick.me front slash estimate and take this poll. Uh, happy to type this in or try to as best as I can. And see how you do. Guess the length of the bar, guess the size of the circles. I'll give you, you know, 20, 30 seconds in my head. I'm hearing the Jeopardy theme go by. Now you're all hearing the Jeopardy theme go by, aren't you? should gaslight people and actually start playing the theme and going, no, oh, I didn't play the theme. What theme? Yep, oh, don't type in the answers. All right, I'll give you another 10 seconds to show. And then we're going to look at the results as of earlier today. And then we're going to see how this group did. And voila, here are the results as of a little while ago. And I got to, you know, this is warms my heart to see that over 3,000 people have taken this thing and just look at the wide distribution of guesses for the circle. Yeah, you got 40% getting it right, but in fact, you have more people getting it wrong if you look at you know, the, all these wrong answers. But people are guessing all over the place. Look at this, the bar, ridiculous. Few people guessing too low, few people guessing too high, and then a huge number of people just nailing it. If we look and see, hey, which was harder to estimate? And most people say the circles was much harder to estimate. Estimate. Um, let's see how this group did. Let me go to uh, refresh this. And we had 3366 responses. We now have 3393. And instead of looking at the last three years, let me look at the last three hours and see how people did. Thank you very much. You're and um, you're you're good, not great, at the uh, uh, 
at the bars. Uh, 56 got it right, a few people got it wrong, but you're all over the place with the circles and only 33% of you got it right here. So you've kind of proven my point on this, which is what I was hoping for. This doesn't mean circles are bad. Circles are great in certain cases. They're just not very good for making accurate comparisons. So let me try to drive this home a little bit to you. This freaks me out. I first saw that somebody show this um, at a tapestry conference, which is, um, I can't wait to be able to do these things in person. And again, uh, Professor Matthew K, University of Michigan. And everyone that was in this room was a data visualization you know, wonk and said, look, you know the answer to this, but what do you think most people will think? What percentage of the larger circle is the smaller circle? And I will ask lay people, people reading magazines, people who are not into data visualization, and they'll say, I don't know, 75%, 80%. This freaks people out. The smaller circle is 50% of the bigger circle. It just doesn't look that way. It's because we are just not good at judging the area of things. We're good at comparing the length from a common baseline. We're terrible at judging the area of circles, which is why, I just cried a little bit when I saw the Wall Street Journal publish this the other day, trying to show the excess deaths. And look at that first big circle there showing all excess deaths and known COVID deaths. It's twice as big, it doesn't look that way. By the way, this is probably the single worst way you could show this, according to Robert Cosaro, who, who has done studies of what are people good at and, and bad at, the, the, the half circle uh, and a circle within it. It's just not a good way to show it. So I'm not saying don't use circles on a map, just realize they're, they're, they're fine for rough comparisons. They're horrible for exact comparisons. Also, if someone gives you a pushback that the bar charts are boring, it doesn't have to be a bar. It is position from a common baseline. That's the thing that people are really great at. So if you don't wanna do a bar, you wanna lighten up a little bit, maybe you can make a Wilkinson dot plot like this or kind of a combination, a lollipop chart. And, and this kind of appeals to people's love of circles. All right, next item in the list. Your dashboard isn't colorful enough. Please use more colors. And uh, my one of my co I think all three of the authors of the big book of dashboards are in agreement. The number one infraction in data visualization is the misuse of color. So I'm going to show you everything you need to know about using color and data visualization. This is it, sequential diverging categorical highlight and alert. Jeff Schaefer puts this together for the big book of dashboards. And I think it's tantamount to saying, here's everything you need to know about color and data visualization. And here's everything you need to know to compose a hit song. But there is something to be said, too, if you understand where and how these things work. Now, I can't get into all of this right now, but I will get into what I think is the number one infraction, which is too many categorical colors. Okay. I've got 34 countries here. I've got 34 different colors, some with slight difference. What am I supposed to look at? What can I tell from this? Not a whole lot. Um, and I wanna try to drive this home with you a little bit. Now this would work way better in a live format, but imagine I'm in a room with a thousand people. First time I did this was kind of a high wire act. I was going, God, I hope this works. And um, I asked half the people in the room, I say, everybody from this mid part over to the left, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. Everybody else, leave them open. And I showed the first half of the room this for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. And I, I prompted them and say, see if you can draw a conclusion. Then I said, okay, first half. Your eyes were open, close them. Other group, if they were closed, open them. I'm gonna show you this. One, two, three, four, five. I'll then ask the first group, what conclusions did you reach really hoping you know, that someone didn't see one of the bars was a little higher than the most, but they looked at what I wanted them to look at. Oh, everything's a dull gray except those two things. And you almost always the first person I call on says, oh, sales on the weekends were less. 
And I'll ask people in the first group, how many people saw that? And, and four out of five hands go up. Huge number of hands up. Say, so keep your hands up. Other group, how many of you saw that? Very few hands go up. What conclusion can we reach? Oh, this side of the room, way smarter than the other side of the room. No, they haven't seen what they've each seen, <laughs> what the other group saw. And I'll show them this and they immediately see it. On the left, color is telegraphing something. It's saying, I want you to look at this thing because I think it's important. On the right, color is doing nothing. You have to fight color to find something interesting. You're realizing color isn't doing anything here to help me understand this. All right, I'll do one more, which is pie charts are great and donut charts are even better. By the way, pies do have their place. They're much derided. There's a great white paper from Stephen Few in 2006 called Pies Are Best for Dessert, but uh, I'll you know, explain where and how you can use them and where they just fumble terribly. Um, so, you know, uh, have a look at this for a second. And, you, you know, this is what would get a scaredy cat. This is not particularly useful, and, and I'll try to explain why. You can really only tell roughly how big one or two of the slices are. Let me try to make my point with that. Let's just focus on tables for a minute. How big a slice is tables? And, and you know, it's kind of hard to tell. And some people that are, you know, pretty astute with this will say, okay, you know what, uh, I don't know, about one quarter. Looks about one quarter. Maybe if you're really good, well, is it a little less than one quarter? Is it one quarter or is it a little more than one quarter? And go, I don't have a clue. Watch what happens when I rotate this so that the slice I'm interested in starts at midnight. Dang, I can see immediately that's a little less than one quarter. By the way, I'm clueless about machines and bookcases and copiers. This is why, by the way, with pie charts, these measuring cups are an instant and brilliant read. This comes from Welcome Industries, and I think that's just so cool. But now let's go back to kind of the flaws with pies and where bars work better. Which is bigger, copiers and machines, and how much bigger are those? And it's like, oh man, that's really hard to tell. But if I do this as a bar chart, Oh my God, it's ridiculously easy. So I want to sh show you this very cool remaking of a pie chart. And then I'm going to kind of go back and show where pies have their place. Uh, this comes from Joey Kucherchuk from Dark Horse Analytics, and I love this. Remove to improve the pie chart. All right, let's start by removing the backgrounds. Okay, let's remove the borders. Okay, let's get rid of the redundant legend. We don't need that. Let's remove the 3D, never useful. Remove the bolding. Reduce the colors. Okay, that's looking good. Let's remove, wait a second, you're removing the wedges. Let's thicken the lines. And let's emphasize the bacon. I think that's absolutely brilliant. But the pie does have its place. It's great for one thing, showing the part to the whole relationship, which was why I even had a pie chart in that, are you older, how, you know, older, much older or younger you um, than other Americans. So watch what happens. I wanna know how big of the whole is California? Oh, I'll select California, instant read, little less than one quarter. And if I select a whole bunch of states, how much do these all add up? instant read, I can see they're a little less than 50%. So a pie with just two slices or maybe three, one pie, two, three slices most, just fine. Because it's an instant part to whole relationship. All right, so that's the pie. Let's discuss the donut. And just as I was, you know, uh, disappointed, um, uh, in the Wall Street Journal for having what I thought was, it was a great article. And the other charts in the article were fantastic. It was just that main one trying to show the excess deaths. It's like, wow, you're kind of, you're, 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 you're minimizing something which is pretty significant. And Wall Street Journal is not terribly alarmist uh, writing. Uh, I died a little bit inside when Tableau published this as part of their um, data culture um, initiative and data culture white paper, where they have a donut chart 
uh, trying to compare progress across multiple donuts. It's really hard to do. So let me explain. I have zero problem with this progress towards a goal. Oh, even without the 45% in there, I can see it's a little less than a half. Bingo. You know, Alaska Airlines telling me how much, you know, you know, how far along in my journey I am. All right. This becomes really hard, north, south, east, and west. And you'll notice, wait a minute, excuse me, north, south, and east. I don't even see west. You know why I don't see west? West crushed it. They met 105% of their goal. How do you show that on a donut chart? You don't. Also, how much bigger is north than east? Well, gosh, I guess it's twice as big. How did you do that? Oh, I looked at the numbers. Take the numbers out, and you can't do that. We're here. It's trivial. Just look at north and east. Don't look at the numbers. I can see that bar is about twice as big. Oh, I can see I exceeded. So, the, the, again, you've got to be kind with your stakeholder and say, you know, I think this will work a little better and here's why. But there's the before version and it's just a faster read with this version that's here. Uh, I'll do one more that's here, which is it's not just, a, 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 not this 100%, but also I wanna see how much larger something is than, than other things. So I can see the chairs overall is a, a little more than twice as big as copiers overall. Also, if I just look at the east, I can see that chairs is twice as big as copiers. I can also see that if I go back to this, I can see the tables overall is a little bigger than machines. And, but for the east, I can see that machines is a little bit more than tables. Let me show you what this looks like as a donut chart useless. Looks cool, but try to make comparisons. Try to learn anything from this. It's really bad. So I do want to say, you know, as I'm, I'm spent a fair amount of time, you know, discussing how you can gently try to win uh, a data visualization argument. And by the way, you know, notice that I'm kind of a believer the pie has its place. So if you got someone who loves pie charts, you could say, hey, why don't we do it in conjunction with this? But realize these people are not your adversaries. They're your stakeholders and they should be your collaborators and get them involved, get their feedback, say, hey, which of these two, three things I've got, all of which I think are pretty good. There's usually more than one way to do a data visualization that's still analytically okay. Um, get their opinion on stuff and, and something magical happens when these stakeholders become your collaborators. Collaboration isn't me saying red and you saying blue and us agreeing on purple, that's compromise. Collaboration is when we make something together that is better than what either of us would have made separately. So, and I kind of want to leave you with that and be thinking about your stakeholder as, as you know what, this person, these people that I've, I'm going to get them to collaborate with me. I'm going to understand their business needs, and they're going to start to understand the potency of data visualization. A couple of quick plugs. This book, The Big Book of Dashboards, that's for you. That's for you as the practitioner. And this is a tool agnostic book, and it's about making business dashboards. And I believe we're going to have a, a signed copy giveaway shortly. The book that is coming out in May 2021, this is for your stakeholders. This is for the other people in your organization that need to read and understand the charts that you want to share with them and don't yet appreciate just how powerful this can be. So realize, you know, this book came about in dealing with the practitioners and their frustration and the, oh my gosh, we have a huge amount of educating that we need to do. And so book on the left is for you, book on the right is for uh, your stakeholders, your boss, your, um, your colleagues, your clients. Um, one more quick plug. Um, I'm giving a, a, a dashboard design workshop next week. I've got three slots remaining. Um, and I can leave this up there for, you can just go to my website, datarevelations.com and you'll find it pretty quickly. But there is the uh, URL 
BBOD stands for Big Book of Dashboards 2021jan.eventbrite.com. And here is where we can continue the discussion. And if something I said didn't resonate with you, you disagree with it, you want me to show something again, you have an anecdote or an example, I would love to hear about it. datarevelations.com, there's my email, and there is my Twitter handle. Um, and with that in mind, why don't I stop sharing? And happy to open this up to Q&A. Um, uh, Randy, do you want to moderate that and figure out which questions you want to go have go first? Or Tim, do you want to do that? No, happy to have either of you. Well, I'll jump on. That works. Well, uh, so thank you, Steve. Throw a big, big applause. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure. So the, the first question on here is from Eric. Um, so he's new to the data of his job market. Um, he has a question about, uh, you know, having your profile. Do you kind of target a larger profile um, with a broad set of skills? You, you try to keep it more focused, um, showing off personality and work ethic. So the, the, the I'm going to share something, but Tim, you could answer this. Randy, you could answer this as well. And my advice is coming from um, that, uh, of all people, Art Garfunkel, you know, of Simon and Garfunkel. Um, and I saw him when he was kind of making a comeback. A, a good friend of mine was his music director um, and was talking about mentoring someone who was doing a demo and said, make two A plus things rather than five or 10 B plus things. And it kind of stuck with me. And it was like, the, I thought that was an interesting response to this, which is um, now it, it that answer, yeah, but suppose someone would love to have a generalist and someone who could do a lot of things pretty well. Um, I don't know the answer, but I would say having at least one thing, which is, wow, that's really, uh, that really shows um, a great understanding of the data, the problem, and a great way to present it is better than having a massive portfolio. I'd rather see two, three really great things than a hundred so-so things. But um, um, that's me, Randy and Tim, you may have, and others may have different thoughts on this. So uh, my initial thought is, um, you know, I, I tend to lean slightly the other way. Um, in that, you know, there have been folks out there, specifically with Tableau, right? You've been using the tool for years and been doing the same thing over and over. Uh, when I look at a portfolio, I like to see a little bit of diversity. Um, but I mean, there's, there's a flip side of that. And Steve just mentioned that. I, and that's why I think it's also important for, you know, companies to be doing, you know, interviews with their hands on with data and these sort of things. But uh, like I said, I, I tend to lean slightly the other way, um, right? Showing a range of skills. Uh, would, would, uh, would well, I don't just, dis I'm not disagreeing with you. I think in two or three dashboards, you can show an amazing range of skills. Um, so I'm no disagreement there. I'm, I'm, I'm just meaning, I think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more of quantity versus quality. Okay. So, uh, but, uh, but Tim, I'm, I, I accept that, um, mm -hmm. Uh, as as good advice and something to consider. And Eric, do realize the community is second to none in terms of helping and nurturing. Uh, ask people for feedback. Ask people, hey, uh, participate in the various, you know, Makeover Monday. The one that I love now is Real World Fake Data, RWFD, which is, um, you know, much more about hey, how am I going to present these kind of business data in a business context? Uh, great opportunity to um, uh, participate and create a portfolio of stuff. I love that Eric's on the right path, though, that number one, you have to show something, right? You do people when they're trying to hire you, they want to see that you've done work. And in a lot of cases, you can't share the work that you've done for a prior either employer or contractor or whatever. Um, you generally are going to have to create something for your portfolio or something that you can share. Um, but usually I would say more than one, but not too many. You don't need 20 um, for my advice. So you know, take the next, uh, next one. Uh, Jared says, do you believe certain visualizations are bad, wrong, or just less efficient than others in terms of time to insight? So um, 
the in the big book of dashboards, we have a clear, easy to read icon that says, don't make a viz like this. But it was interesting. Originally, we just called it the cat. And then we called it the screaming cat. And the, the problem with calling it a screaming cat was sometimes people just, you know, they're doing their best, they're trying, and it isn't the best way to show data. And you've kind of hit them with this thing and go, well, you suck. And that's not what you want to do in criticism, data criticism. However, you will sometimes see charts which are horribly misleading. You know, bar charts where the, you know, the value axis doesn't start at zero. Those go beyond screaming cats. Those things are what um, uh, Christopher Danielson called turds, truly unfortunate representations of data. Um, so you know, the issue is, did you leave something on the table? Did you make it harder for somebody to understand? So, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with a, uh, with a pie chart. There's nothing inherently wrong with packed bubbles. I've used them when I want to have something which is dramatic, like a giant bubble and three other really tiny ones where making an exact comparison is not so important. But it's when it's, you know, you just made it a lot harder for somebody to do something. That's a bad, you know, that's, that, that would be like a scaredy cat visualization. And if you've intentionally misled somebody to try to make sales look better than they are, or the gap look bigger than it really is, well, then that's a screaming cat or a turd. And I got Randy to help me make a few turds for the. Uh, uh, yeah, we made some turds. <laughs> yeah, we made some some we, we 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 there were some graphics from a certain news organization that we needed to recreate. I <laughs> leave it as an exercise to guess which news organization uh, it was. So the news organization wouldn't give me permission to include their terrible work in the book. Yes. Go figure that. All right, we have a, excuse me if I mispronounce this, but a question from Gian about uh, speaking at a future event. Um, I'm not sure if that's something you want to answer live or take that offline. I don't know. Will there be snacks? <laughs> <laughs> well, you might, maybe it's an intro to, you know, if someone wanted to reach you and talk to you about that, what's the best way to get a hold of you, Steve? Um, S. Wexler at datarevelations.com. Go to the website. Um, Easy enough to to find um, to find me. I'll type. That. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, Godson asks uh, with the advent of AI. Um, would you say that uh, BI jobs are at risk? And if no, why not? Um, the, 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 the I'm probably least qualified uh, to discuss it. Not that that's ever stopped me from expressing an opinion, but um, um, the realize there's so much smarts that's built into Tableau from day one, the whole, gee, if you drag this pill here and this pill there, it goes, oh, I should do this. I'm going to make it a bar chart. I'm going to make it like this, et cetera. There's a ridiculous amount of AI that's been built into the tool since day one. And you can still make incredibly terrible charts um, with Tableau. So um, the I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful aid it's going to allow people to query things in natural language. I'm highly skeptical. Um, I think it will just mean, oh, you'll be able to focus on more things that bring your unique perspective to the table. But uh, Randy and Tim, you may have different views about that. Um, so it, to me, it goes back to you know what your boss always wants you to be doing with BI, and that's really finding the insight. If, if AI can help you get to that place faster, all the better. And there's, there's better places where you could be spending your time and your focus. 
I do think from the data biz standpoint, especially when we're talking about if you're communicating and if you're presenting and if you're either a dashboard or a report or a presentation, you've actually got to put a lot of thought into what is it you want to communicate? What what bars are you going to highlight? You know, where are you going to put a, a trend line or a goal line and, and what is it your context and what are you going to compare to? There's so much thought that goes into good communication that I do not see like AI taking that over anytime soon. Yeah. I want. I really want to thank you. There was a slide that I didn't include, but it's the there's something you should always be thinking about as you're building your dashboards or your presentations. Who's your audience? What's the message? Um, what do you want them to take away? And how do you provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort? Knowing your audience and their expectations. Um, oh, how are they going to react to this? Or what are they going to think? That's hard. You know, that's the whole skill that you're, Randy, you're going in with your, 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 your fellow instructor, Steve, about, you know, reading the audience and being able to tell what works, what doesn't. So, um, Godson, I think you're safe for a while. Um, so from anonymous attendee, what are your feelings on using animations and dashboard? Are they too much or is there a, a, a scenario that utilizes them well? Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's, look, this is now another tool and you can, um, uh, I like them for subtle transitions. It's the, you know, you think of all the pre-attentive attributes that there are, length, position, color, uh, size, shape, et cetera. Maybe the most potent is movement. And just seeing when you apply a filter that this thing went from this to this, and which things moved a lot and which things moved a little bit can be good. The subtle use of animation can be great. Or you get something like a Hans Rosling uh, type of thing where he's showing Gapminder and showing how the world has changed over the last 50 years. Or a Neil Halloran type of thing. Randy reminded me of that great work, The Fallen of World War II, where you're telling a whole story, but it's playing out as a movie versus GM clicking something and something moved around. You know, the subtle use of this stuff can be great and, and can help people see the things that you want them to notice as they're interacting. So I'm a believer in it. Just don't overdo it. What? Subtle, subtle is the key. Is a key word. Yeah. Right. You got to be careful. Yeah. I'm, I'm in violent agreement with you. What about the difference between while we're on, on that topic between animation and interactivity is do you tie those two together? Do you assume that that's some sort of interaction where they've changed a value or, or made a change on a slider and that causes the animation? Or do you see some dashboards just animate automatically? Well, one is you press a play button and look at the movie. And the other is as you're interacting with it, it is helping you see what your what your action made this change that happened over here. Now, you, you know I'm a huge fan of interactive Activity. And I think organizations would be in much better shape if they were to click more and print less. Um, but that's that's a whole other thing to win. You know, to, look, you got to start by winning people into data visualization, and then you've got to get them out of these static PDFs into well, here's this thing, and if my wonderful you know two page PDF didn't answer your question, you can do a little. If you want to drill down on something I didn't think of before, you can you know. Go to town. All right, next question we have from, uh, from David. He asked about Splunk. Uh, have you used it and what are your thoughts on it? Um, I have never used Splunk to build a dashboard. I know that a lot of people are con you know, connecting Tableau to ingest Splunk data and I have great successes with it. So, but I've never used the tool um, myself. Um, I don't, I'm, hey, chat window, you can answer uh, David's question if you have any experience with that. Um, but I know that, you know, years ago, Splunk and Tableau were, wow, look, look how well, you know, in native integration, connect to Splunk directly and, you know, figure out what's going on with this data. A lot of the tools will do that, right? You'll see that there's no one answer of what a tool is, right? So a lot of them like Power BI or even MicroStrategy or whatever, they might even, they have their own dashboard ability, but they might also feed Tableau and you could use Tableau as your dashboard on top of it, right? So it's not a one shop fits all. Sometimes it's better when you piece these things together. 
that might uh, lead really well into one of our next couple questions here, and it's pros and cons of, of Tableau and Power BI. But I, I, Jared, we're going to answer your question because I really like it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, can you go over the pros and cons of Tableau versus Power BI, <laughs> given that I only know <laughs> one of them? No. Um, and and I'm going to tell you right now that my practice and the stuff that I'm passionate about has nothing to do with a particular tool. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm certainly pretty adept at Tableau, um, but the, the I'm much more f and and love the company and and, and what they're about. Um, I am my passion is is getting people to appreciate what data visualization can do for the organization. So it's not about the tool; it's what you do with the tool. Um, so there's you know this may be a great topic to have, which is you know uh, you now have a bunch of people that are 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 uh, bilingual in these things. It used to be people either knew one or the other, and now you have a bunch of people can really talk about the advantages and disadvantages of them. So, uh, Steve, I was useless. Um, Jared's question. Um, this is where we've got three people answering the questions. We're going to have five opinions on this one. Um, as people become more data literate and data viz becomes more integrated with businesses, well, we got a long way to go there, first of all. But do you think bespoke visualizations, radial bars, sand key charts, et cetera, can be utilized to effectively communicate data in a business setting? The it depends on your audience and if they know how to read these things and they're comfortable with it and they can make accurate comparisons and glean insight fast, well, God bless you. If you can get them to a core diagram, a radial bar chart, etc. I am really, really skeptical of it. Now, part of this is I'm not good at that stuff. You know, by the way, there's a technical term for this. I was speaking with Curtis Harris. I think he first used it. It's called curvy shit. You know, the people who love making, sorry, curvy stuff. Um, and if it were important to me, you know, if I said, you know what, the best way to show this is a radial bar chart, or I really need a sand key here, there are amazing tutorials that will walk you through how to do this. But I'm really skeptical about the use of them in business context for being able to figure out what's going on and making a quick decision. An infographic, something that's going to capture your attention. Maybe you want something which is curvy and, oh, I want to get lost in it and explore it. But for business communication, I'm, I'm skeptical. But if you've got an audience that gets it and loves it and can use it effectively, go, go ahead, make that sand key. Yeah, I mean, me personally, I've seen very few instances of, of things like radial bar charts being decipherable quickly. Um, I think one of the few uh, exceptions to that, and I saw it recently, was um, uh, global temperatures. And it was plotted on a, a radial bar chart. And uh, but it's quite clear when those temperatures started to swing. And, and that's the only reason that particular viz. Works. No, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on that, because that thing goes in a circle. And it's like, why is 2020 right next to 1900? Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, everyone knows Okay, dinosaurs are to the left and Star Trek is to the right because we grew up <laughs> looking at that. Why are you not just doing it this way and making it easy? Oh, I want something that kind of cool and it kind of unwinds and you have the animation. And so this is where the play button, you can see what you're up to, et cetera. Um, this is, by the way, the some of the harm that sometimes the inadvertent harm that may come from something like Makeover Monday or the Iron Viz competition where people see what wins iron viz they go oh my god look at that stuff there's all this curvy stuff in there i guess Fancy. i should be doing that stuff as well and part of it is well no that in the, the, the it's why i love the real world fake data um uh, initiative and and if they were changed the criteria for iron viz to from storytelling and design to which thing is most useful for making a business decision? Um, you would you would suddenly see less curvy stuff and less these ridiculous long form dashboards that all go into the feeder competitions. You know these things that scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. The only place you see that is in feeder competitions for 
Iron Viz, and then you never see a long form dashboard in Iron Viz because you can't build it in 20 minutes. Now, my perspective. So thanks for Jared's asking question the question, is by different. the way. Because my answer would be yes, because I do a whole bunch of bespoke data visualizations for the corporate world, whether it's a, a sand key diagram of their whole budget or you know their five year plan or a, like a radial network map that's a, a clustered bubble or something like that. But it's it's not built for a dashboard or something quick and easy. It might be a custom timeline of the history of the company. You know, it's, oh, it's very look, I've seen custom some of the designed. Didn't it, 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 you know? Um, where was I in the uh, the lobby of some place? And it was, I think, one of your infographics that that was there, and it was great. Oh, was it? And yeah, and it was a um, um, you know, and it was like this is something really great to be sitting, you know, looking at, exploring right. in the lobby of the organization, not making quick. It's about your audience and what you're trying to tell them. So it may be appropriate um, in my practice and the stuff that I'm doing. I'm not seeing. Look, you've got people who don't even know how to read bars properly uh, um, and stuff like that. It is so an advanced if, step. Yeah. If you've got people that can read a sand key and use it intelligently, I'm 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 I want to work at that place. Um I'll I'll let the two of you okay. choose what's next. Godson, uh back with another question. So how do you balance uh turnaround time, uh, essentially quality versus quantity? Um, develop with less uh, clicking, quality color blend, uh, blending, uh, but your manager wants something done yesterday. So how do you manage, I guess, those expectations? Um, Godson, if we have that wrong, feel free to, to chime in in the chat there. And the, the, um, find out what's the minimum they need for who they need it for and say, okay, we may not have all the functionality that you want, but for the, you know, these few things that you want to be able to show that will have people going, wow, that's great. But uh, there's an old aphorism. Um, you can have it um, uh, good. You can have it fast. You can have it cheap. You can only have two out of the three. Um, you don't get all three. Which one do you want? Um, and that, I think that applies here. You just can't get all those things at the same time. I don't know enough about your, you know, management to tell you which is more important. All right, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, David, um, <clears throat> what if your end user is colorblind? It's a good one. Well, you know, real, I think a lot of people you realize that there's very few people who see in monochrome. I've met one. Um, usually in uh, white male Western culture, the colorblind issue is a difficulty with the difference between red and greens. Um, usually. That's, that's, you know, the, the, the people who have color vision deficiency, that's usually where it is. And certain reds look exactly like certain greens. And in fact, classic traffic light red and traffic light green look the same you know, to, to someone. So there are, you don't have to use those colors. Or if someone insists on red and green, you can darken the red, you can lighten the green, you can add some blue to the green and they'll become... Uh, uh, colors that are eas easily distinguished. So there are certainly ways to work around this. Um, the other thing is the cultural associations of red and green. Um, you know, I've grown up green good, red bad. Uh, stock market, green up, red down. Go to the Chinese stock market, go to China and see what, what, what the, the colors are exactly reverse. And red, which usually means warning or a problem can mean, hey, this is happy, you know, prosperity. So the cultural associations with red and green may be totally different depending on your audience. Now we also generally won't know who's in your audience that has a color vision deficiency. It's not something people bring up, right? Hey, so and, and, statistically, there's what, I think it's 8% of men in the U.S. have some form of color vision deficiency, and you will never know who it is in your audience. The, the other is a great line from a, a dear friend, uh, Kelly Martin, um, uh, and she said, you know, there's no way to un-ugly red and green. <laughs> yeah, just to, to add a piece to that, that uh, 
you know, the, the colorblind piece. If that's something you're concerned about with your work, there are uh, websites and places online where you can take a snapshot of your dashboard and, and load it into their uh, to their portal, and it will tell you what colors do and don't work. Um, if I can find the link here, I'll pop it into the chat. But there oh, reasons- oh, there is an app that just kicks ass, this um, CVS simulator by this... Um, um, CVS simulator, I can take the you know picture of this thing and then w- whatever I've got, and it will show me immediately the you know the 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 um, deuteranopia, protodopia, and then I can't remember what the third one is. Uh, this Japanese developer, he has a website, and I just found out. I don't, Randy, maybe you told me about it. I can't remember. I don't know. I have a, uh, uh, I have a whole page on cool infographics about color pickers, and a lot of them have that, but I don't have that app. It's called CV CV Simulator Color Vision Simulator. It it's it's so fun. And I just go like this, and, and it's go, a yeah, it's a mobile app. Okay, yeah. And so it, I didn't know about it. It wasn't around with the Big Book of Dashboards. So there are a bunch of things that you can do. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to say if you're going to have created a visualization that's going to alienate one out of ten of your audience. Yeah, I was looking for. Does he have a? Hold on. You know what? I'm going to find it, it for folks. There it it's... is. I found his website. You're good. Okay, he got it faster than I did. It's like, oh, we'll just get the, the manuscript for the new book. Chromatic, chromatic vision simulator. Oh, chromatic. Thank you. Or if that's not the one you're talking about, that's another one. But it's on the phone and the desktop. Yeah, and hold on. I'll let me. Hey, you guys talk, answer the question. I'll bring up the thing. And I'll find it quickly enough. Uh, Ray, you, you might have some thoughts on this next one. Um, what percent of a, a BI job is actually building the visual, building the dashboard? Oh, so I'm I'm trying to look up that you know answer to that question <laughs> right now. So why don't you answer this thing? I'm um, busy really here. Job. If your job is an analyst. You know, there's probably only 20, 25% of your time is, that's my rough guess from what I've been working on, you know, is actually building visuals, trying to find the right visualization, customize that visualization so you're communicating the message the right way. And then once you've built it, when you're doing your analytics of the dashboard, you're going to update it. And it's, it's updating, you know, month after month or week after week or whatever, uh, or if it's a report that you're putting out, um, that type of thing. But if you're the analyst, you're doing a lot of data analytics first, um, making sure that the data makes sense, that it's clean, that you've actually got some insights in the data. Um, that's really where most of your time is spent. If you're a data viz designer, which is what I do, you know, it's 90% of your time is doing the data viz. I'm just going to look up real world fake data. You know, I've got, there are, are people that can be answering the questions and looking this stuff up at the same time. I'm not I one of them. I think. There Mark, we go. His, yeah, absolutely. Ooh, okay. I want to answer that second question, but we can take uh, Latitha's question first. Do you have any suggestions for quick design tips uh, when the data is given and asked to build a dashboard in short time? Um, it's hard for me to come up with the design and tips. Please let me know. Again, short time. The, um, the one is this will become way easier as you get a little more experience. But the, the, the first of all, do you understand the data? Do you know what's there? And I've got to say, you know, I'm not trying to plug a tool, but this is why I just love Tableau. It allows me to interrogate the data and, and see what makes it cook, what might be interesting. The other thing is, and this is kind of a plug from, from the first book, is you look for, well, how did somebody else handle this type of stuff? You know, this type of data. You know, this is there, you know, where can I look to see if I have this scenario or this problem or this situation, how did somebody else tackle it? And you look for an example and go, okay, that's pretty good. So now I have a model for what I should be creating. That's the whole idea behind the big book of dashboards is you got this situation. How many case studies were there? Um, I think um, there are over 30. 
uh, in, in, you know, there, I think there are 28 different scenarios, but there, there are a lot of different, uh, or you could do it this way or this way, et cetera. But I think there are 28 different um, business cases in there. And you'll probably find something that at least has some similarity to it. Sorry for the plug, but I actually think it will be helpful. <laughs> Say if your time short, though, make sure you understand what's going to help make decisions for whoever you're designing for, right? And then I think you talk about this, Steve, in your book. I mean, people read right to left, top to bottom. So put the most important thing that's going to help them make those decisions right up front, right up at the top of the dashboard. So that even if you could, you know, later come up with a better way to visualize the data, the way you visualized it first off in a short amount of time is still right up front in front of them. Now, I would add, be intentional about who you're designing for as well, um, right? So you're going to have different levels of, of not only data literacy, but data consumers in the organization from C-suite folks all the way down to analyst level. Um, consider who you're designing for, and that will help you kind of figure out uh, what visuals need to be there and, uh, and what order they need to be in. And, you know, right, this is the one I wanted to take from anonymous attendee. Can you recommend a, a primer or primer, depending on, you know, England or United States, on how to train your leadership audience to wean them off tables and into visualizations? Yes, it's called the big picture, and it's coming out in May. That's exactly. No, I did not. I'm not an anonymous <laughs> attendee. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it's uh, been built for, and that's that's uh, uh, to help leadership and and the entire organization get up to a certain minimum level of data visualization literacy, graphicacy, this wonderful made up word, so that you can all have intelligent discussions around the data. So thank you for giving me that. Uh, thank, thanks for the softball. Funny you should bring that, that was, up. That was totally a softball. Yeah, there we go. All uh, right. So, so Randy, have you figured out how we're going to give away a signed copy of the Big Book of Dashboards? Yes. So we've had uh, 83 people register on Zoom for it, but not everybody's here. So it must be present to win. There you go. Um, there you go. Um, like that gotta be here yeah you have to stay um, to the end you know you know okay yep. unmute me now so let me share <laughs> so i've got uh, excel's gonna do a random number generator and i've got the list of the people that registered so we'll see if if the number uh gives me a person that's here Oops, i gotta be actually in excel so 64 scroll down is uh nikki subo Nikki Subo here. I may be mispronouncing that. Yes, yeah. Nikki is, I see, uh, spelled with a leading M. With M, right. M S U B O. Yes. All right. So somebody uh, wake I Nikki up. <laughs> somebody wake Nikki up. There she is. Nikki won the book. Um, so what's the easiest way, Steve? You want me to get her uh, mailing address and we'll ship one out to her? Yes, please. Or okay. I can you know, um, figure out the best way to do so, it. Nikki, you can either send me a note through Meetup. I will stick my email address right here in chat as well. Um, and send me an email and we will make arrangements to send that your way, a signed copy of the Big Book of Dashboards. And All right, we got one question left in the panel. If you would answer one last, we'll call this the final question and then we will wrap it up. We got Godson who asks, do you think that now the focus is shifting from actionable insights, simple visuals, uh, to which the developer has the most experience with complex data? I'm not. No, so are we shifting to more complex data visualizations, maybe even interactive? versus quick and easy, um, simple communication visuals. Whatever needs to be done so the people that need to understand the data to make decisions, better decisions faster, will lead the day. And I'm almost always lean towards make it as simple as possible, but 
um, simple but not simplistic. Simple to understand. Kind of my recommendation on that. And hold on a sec, I'll do another one more. Uh, and if you are interested in attending the workshop, there is the link for it. Bigpick.me front slash Jan. So I should probably put an H to yes. So many people in corporate America are dealing with data now. I mean, supervisors on the floor, warehouse people, admins in the office. I mean, the water rising has gotten, you know, has everybody dealing with data. So you have the more advanced users now, but now people who have never dealt with data before are at that beginner level. And so you're going to have that different range of understanding. You're going to need that really basic simple communication for people who are just starting out and using data for the first time. But you're going to have the data scientists. You're going to have the, you know, the analytics team that can really handle something that's really oh, deep. You, you just, you, 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 really good point. Both of you have just crushed it with some really good insights. And I'm just thinking of, you know, I don't show a box plot to most of my uh, in most of my stakeholders, the people mm -hmm. that I build stuff for. If my audience is statisticians, and I'm, I, you know, when I'm doing something, it's like, <laughs> how can you not be showing them exactly what they expect to see in this situation? But I show that to other people, they're going to go, well, what the hell, you know, what is this madness? I don't understand this thing. Why are you showing it to me? Um, also, remember one last thing. No one wants to come off as dumb. So if you have a complex visualization, you understand it, you know what it means. This person may not have been um, brought up with how to understand what the chart is trying to tell them. And instead of them going, you know, this looks like it's really cool. Can you walk me through it? They're going, well, this is just nonsense. This is useless. It's not helping me. So kind of realizing that, hey, maybe you have to teach them how to read these things without being maybe quite so brazen is something to look into. So Randy, thanks for bringing up that point about, you may have some people who are very sophisticated and you show them the more sophisticated stuff. All right, Steve, thank you so much. We're gonna wrap it there. So thank you, big, big hand for Steve. We appreciate you so much. Oh, thanks um, for having me, Tim, pleasure. Um, yeah. And uh, hey, for, to everybody, I'm hoping tomorrow is one of the most boring days any of us have had in a long time. Um, please leave any feedback, thoughts, comments on the Meetup site. You'll probably get a note from Meetup or something like that. Um, and if you had any feedback about how the event went or anything like that, my email I just put in the chat, feel free to send me a note. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thanks so much.